Hello and welcome to The Watchful Citizen, a local access program presented by the Lancaster County Democratic Party. I'm your host, Jane Egan. Today's guest is Rick Best, candidate for legislature. Rick is running uh, for the pleasure of representing Legislative District 21 in Lincoln, which covers the northwestern portion of Lincoln and Lancaster County. Rick, welcome to the program. Jane, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the honor of spending this time with you. I got to say, I did watch a few of the YouTube videos of you and appreciate how easy you made it look. I'm only slightly nervous to oh, be well, here today. We'll get past that, believe me. <laughs> I'm nervous too, so we'll do this together. Take some time to introduce yourself uh, to our viewers. Uh, what do they want? To, uh, what, what do you want them to know about you as a, a candidate and uh, a little bit about your background? I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I've been a Nebraska resident all of my life. I was born in Superior, Nebraska, which is South Central. Uh, started life on a small farm out near Edgar, Nebraska, actually, near my grandparents. Uh, my dad wasn't there at the beginning because he was serving in the United States Navy during the Korean conflict, but he came back and we farmed with my grandparents for a few years. Uh, great start to life on the farm, enjoyed it, but uh, my folks moved to Greenwood, which is just northeast of Lincoln a few miles. Small rural community. I tell everybody it's, it really was like Mayberry RFD growing up there. The whole, everybody knew each other in the community. You really didn't dare to cause any trouble because your folks would know before you got home if you did anything mischievous. Uh, just really good people. It was uh, one of those places where in the summer you'd just go around to different families and spend time on the porch drinking iced tea and talking about what was going on. Uh, summer baseball, scouts were a big part of my early growing up. And it was really there in Greenwood that my values were shaped. Uh, the values that I've talked about in other encounters with folks, values like hard work, uh, responsibility and community those were an important part of that that little village and I learned them well there I appreciated that they've carried on with me I eventually graduated from Ashland Greenwood High School uh, stayed in Ashland uh, worked for BNSF Railway Company and raised my five children in Ashland they're all graduates of Ashland Greenwood great school system out there I'm very fortunate all five of my children are grown now and they are married to good people and I have to be honest they're raising the best grandchildren in the world of <laughs> now if you have grandchildren yours are probably the best too but uh, anyway I'm just really grateful that they're very responsible individuals enjoy them a lot uh, about six years ago I moved to Lincoln uh, married my current wife Dawn we, we live up on North uh, on the northwest part of town, obviously, near 27th Street and in the interstate. Um, so that expanded the family. Between us, we have eight children, eight in-laws, and 17 grandchildren. Needless to you say. Have a big Thanksgiving. Oh, gosh. Any crazy uncles in there? Or? Well, we, 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 don't have we, to we, we limit that. those. <laughs> <laughs> I might be the crazy uncle. I'm not sure. Um, and then uh, I did complete my my career with BNSF last year. I started in 1974 at Havelock Shops as a Carmen apprentice. Uh, Carmen are the employees who inspect the freight cars that we see going by down the tracks, the cars that haul the grain or the coal or any of those freight cars, and they make the repairs required of it. Havelock's a great facility for the BNSF Railway Company and for the city of Lincoln. A lot of good jobs there. I did transfer over for the last 14 years of my career, worked in, on the management side of the company in the, what's called the General Claims Department. Uh, railroads self-insure, and so when there's an, any kind of incident involving liability, say uh, property, da property damage, maybe a motor vehicle accident, or we got onto somebody's property, or personal injuries, employee injuries, or grade crossing accidents, uh, we would be called out to the site, work to investigate what happened, who was where, who did what, and then evaluate the cases and attempt to resolve them. So I retired after 40 years with the company a year ago, just been really enjoying life since that time. 
So I understand that there's a mediation uh, component to your uh, was it work history, or is it was that part of your volunteer uh, work? Or well, can you I, talk I about that a little I, bit. I appreciate you asking about that. No, that's a big part of my life. Um, I went back to college in 1994 at Doan College Lincoln. While I was working at Havelock Shops during the day, Doan College is great for, for, the, for those of us who did get it the first time through and needed a little more practice. I uh, went back there, graduated in 1998 with a degree in human relations. And I, I wanted to use that in some way within the company, and it took me a few years before I got in general claims, which worked. And in the meantime, in 1998, I became aware of mediation training through the state of Nebraska. Uh, the Department of Justice has uh, a department called the Office of Alternative Dispute Resolution, and that's mediation. Though, so there's several level layers of training. I took those. Uh, Debbie, Deborah Brown here, Deborah Denny now, uh, was one of the instructors, really got me excited about mediation, and I've been doing that since 1998 as a side, not as part, of, well, I use the skills at work, but I, I do the mediation at, uh, on my own time, which is... Deb is a friend of mine. Oh, I've serious? known her for over 40 years. Yeah. She, she yeah, is just a, an institution in mediation in Nebraska. Yeah, we agree. couldn't have the developed system that we have without her and some others like her. She's done some very good work. So uh, you have kind of a, 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 a varied uh, background, uh, kind of blue collar and then in the that's white right. collar that's administrative. Right. So it looks like things have kind of dovetailed for you to come uh, to the idea that you wanted to represent uh, your district uh, in the unicameral. Can you kind of talk a little bit about how you uh, decided to become involved in politics, or have you always been involved uh, in politics in some way? That's, that's actually a really great, great summary of, of my life experience there. Um, I've always had a, a deep interest in politics, followed it closely, been aware of candidates and issues, uh, and, and somewhat active. And when I was in Ashland, I helped campaign for different candidates. I was actually in Legislative District 21 in Ashland. The district's now shrunk down to where it just ends at Lancaster County. Uh, four years ago, I had the opportunity to serve on Ken Har's staff or council, or whatever the right term is. Got to sit in on the meetings with Ken and his wife and people who were working with him. Just found the whole process fascinating. And then I did some very serious door knocking for Ken, you know, meeting a lot of people in the district. Found it just fascinating to go talk to different citizens. You know, some don't want to spend a lot of time together, some aren't happy to see, or don't, you know, they, not everybody's popular with everybody, right? But a lot of times you can have a really good conversation about issues and politics, and I just find that very encouraging. So often we hear bad news about how terrible things are in our state or in our country, but when I go door to door and I meet the citizens of District 21, I'm very encouraged because we are a country, a state, a community that's built on hardworking responsible people who understand that sometimes we have to work together to get the bigger projects done. So that, that was a big part of it. I really enjoy people. I am retired now, as I said. My skill set that you identified with blue collar background, white collar back experience, uh, mediation, uh, having set in hundreds of mediations, I just feel like they've prepared me to go to the legislature, work with folks from different perspectives, find out what's really important and how we can move our state forward. And it's really important to me. I grew up in a great state. I want that legacy to carry on. Those 11, those 17 grandchildren, I want them to grow up in a state that is great and progressive as the one I grew up in. So uh, you're doing a little bit of campaigning. Uh, tell us about uh, the organization of your campaign. Um, you're going door to door. There's some other ways that you're reaching voters. And, and what are the voters saying to you? Well, uh, it's been an interesting experience. I know that 
there's some big issues being debated and addressed in the legislature. I've found an interesting mix among the voters I've, whose doors I've knocked on. There hasn't been an overriding theme. You, you do get the tax issue frequently, but most people then follow that up by saying, I understand we have to pay taxes. So <laughs> I, think, right. I think they just want to make sure that you're aware that they don't want to pay any more than is necessary to run our government effectively. Uh, but I do hear issues, you know, that are familiar to me about uh, keeping the state functioning efficiently, uh, moving forward with green energy it has been a, one that I've come across several times, and just making sure that our government is working in a way that will keep our state strong. That's the most common theme of all. It, it's been a great experience I've met. I can't count how many people I've met, either through people I'm meeting in the party, people like yourself, and the people who are here working today to make this show possible. And I'm going to just thank Jim and Janine and Benny for their efforts today. This doesn't happen just right. by you and I <laughs> sitting here. <laughs> there, right. There's a lot of hard work going on. And I've just <laughs> met and John and Krista Yoakum, who are just terrific people and terrific ambassadors for our party. So I, I'm meeting people like that. I'm meeting people at the doorstep and uh, just a tremendous experience to realize how many people are working hard to keep, keep things working in a way that's good for all of us. So uh, you're talking to the voters uh, besides the tax uh, issue, which is, like you say, it's always on everybody's mind. Uh, what are some of the other issues uh, that you feel uh, are important uh, to work hard for if you're elected? And um, yeah, just elaborate on that a little bit. Maybe okay. childhood education, I think, is an interest of yours. No, that, that's, ag that's, that's right on. Um, as I said, the, the values that I have with hard work, responsibility, community, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that I'm responsible for my life. I can certainly blame everyone else for any problems I have, but the truth is I have to be responsible about what I do. And I raised my kids that way. My kids are raising their grandkids that way. I'm sure your family's the same way. But I've had some life experiences that opened my eyes. And uh, my three daughters all worked in the foster care system in some different avenue. And I became acquainted with children who were not being raised in environments where they were taught that they were capable human beings and that they could learn and that they could have opportunities. And that is a heartbreaking experience to look at these precious children. I'm sorry, I, I get a little choked up. I understand. To, to see these children who are so precious and understand that if unless something changes, they aren't going to understand that. And you can't suddenly wake up at 16, year old, 16 years old and unwrite all that script that's been put into them. So early childhood development programs, uh, uh, I've, I've come to know them a little bit. I'm not an expert on them. When I was talking to Dick Campbell about this very topic a few weeks ago, he reminded me that Average kids will come into school at age five or six with a vocabulary of about 3,000 words. Children growing up in poverty or in, in neglectful homes will show up for school with a vocabulary of 300 words. You can imagine the difficulties that creates right off the bat. Our teachers don't have the time and the resources to catch those 300 word kids up to, with everybody else. So it's important that we capture them early, get them the skills and the training. It's not just having a big vocabulary, it's learning how to relate to others and fit in, which is a big part of being successful in school and in life. Giving them that fighting chance, that opportunity to take responsibility and to be successful members of our society. That one's very near and dear to my heart. And, and to our credit, Nebraska has some programs already in place. I just want to make sure that we're reaching as many, if, if not all, the at-risk kids. You still have some that are falling through the cracks for whatever reason, and you do want to catch those. You're absolutely right. We want to extend those programs as far as we can. Like I say, my grandkids, they're getting it all. I'm fortunate, but the ones that are getting left out, we need to help them. Other issues of interest? Um, I think you mentioned Medicaid expansion uh, might be something that you are looking at. Uh, where do you stand on that? There's been a lot of work done 
by some people, and currently we've got some bills. Um, yes. So uh, go ahead and elaborate on where you're at on that. Well, certainly Senator Campbell's done terrific work moving that, that issue forward. It hasn't happened yet, but we're closer than we've ever been before. And to follow along with my theme from the early childhood development, this is just another tool that working people who don't have insurance need to help take the right kind of responsibility for their life. I think it's a real win for our state in that we can bring in funding that's available to us. It will cost us some, it's true, but I think the return will be well worth it. And just understanding that people having health care so that they can get the care they need in a timely manner and not delay it until it becomes an emergency or a crisis, which then they're going to get care and then the expenses are incurred and we're all going to end up paying for it anyway. In some form or another, it's getting passed on. So I, I would, I'm definitely in favor of finding a way to expand Medicaid. I think there are a lot of groups aligned that are seeing this the same way. On both sides of the political spectrum, actually. Well, that it, is one place where we've got some agreement. Yes, yes, no, that, that's exactly right. We were seeing folks, uh, business leaders coming forward saying it's time for us to do this. And I, 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 to be fair, I don't know all the arguments against it. I hope it's not just some personalization of the issue that's because it's been related to President Obama. I hope we're moving beyond that and we can have a real honest discussion about the benefits and the costs uh, of that. I, I think it's it's a win for our state. I would support I agree. That. Okay. Um, being a state senator requires working with people uh, across the aisle that hold different views uh, on the issues. Uh, sounds like you would be someone that have some specific skills that would uh, make that work for you. Can you kind of elaborate on maybe how you intend to approach that? There, that's, that is actually a great question. Um, I think it could happen that you'll run into people who you disagree with if you were elected to the legislature. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've heard stories. Uh, as, you, as you noted earlier, I, uh, I have uh, a somewhat unique background. Uh, I was a union member. As a railway carman, I was a member of the Carmen's Union. Paid my dues for all 40 years of my career, even when I worked in management. Uh, I can remember walking the picket line back in the day when unions used to strike once in a while. So that part of that part of me is is there and will be forever. But I've also understood the responsibilities of making decisions to run a company and how it's a different perspective. Both sides want the company to be successful. Both sides want to have a good work environment where people can come to work, work safely, uh, do their jobs effectively. And, and everybody's goals are really the same. They just have different ways of getting there. And not only did I learn that through my work at BNSF, uh, the mediation training was incredibly helpful. Uh, when you're the mediator, you're a neutral third party, uh, i.e. you have a group here and a group here, and it, it can be individuals, it can be multiple people, it can be entities, business entities, and they have very different perspectives. And one thing they're sure of when they come to the mediation is that they're right and the other person's wrong and they need to see it the way they do. So as the mediator, the, the responsibility becomes to make sure that both parties are heard and understood. And as a mediator, I would do that through taking time with one party feeding back to them what I'm hearing and saying, is that accurate? Is that, did I capture what you're saying? And then doing it with the other party. And when you do that for an individual, you're, you're giving them a very valuable gift. When people feel heard and understood, they start to develop trust. They start to be willing to listen a little bit more themselves and you get to build an exchange of ideas. And you find out, why is this issue really important to you? And what is it that you really want to see happen? Interestingly enough, we have more in common than we do that separates us. And uh, when you start to build on that, you can develop 
consensus building and option generation. In uh, mediation, it's option generation, clarification, and reality testing are tools that we use. And so um, you do that and you find out that we can find solutions that fit everyone's needs. Nobody gets everything they want. You have to be willing to give some, but a lot of times you can build better solutions than either side thought possible, looking at it just from their perspective. That brings to mind a, an issue uh, that has been uh, uh, problematic for the state of Nebraska in the last year or two. Uh, we have a, a prison system in Tecumseh, and we had a riot down there. Uh, I think someone was maybe, I know, injured, but I, maybe someone I, lose their life down there, I, I think. I think so. I think One there of the are prisoners. Yeah. Again, I think the point that you were making is uh, we need to listen to each other. Uh, there was a news article recently that said that the employees down there were very unhappy. Um, that would be an area probably that you would have to face uh, as a legislator uh, in the unicameral is doing something about that. Um, what, I what is your position on prison reform in Nebraska and how do you see resolving some of those issues? Well, I really think that's an important issue from an, uh, several aspects. Um, and it's an issue that we're starting to become increasingly aware of, not just in Nebraska, but uh, across the country. Nationwide. Yes, because the United States incarcerates citizens at a very high rate. If you look at all the nations in the world, we're one of the leaders in incarcerating our citizens. You know, this is an outgrowth of the get tough on crime theme that was popular back 20, 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago now. Time moves on. And, uh, and I, I think we've tried this experiment, and I think it's time to look at it from a very pragmatic point of view and say, is this really working? Do we just want to keep building more prisons and keep following the pattern we've established? I really don't think most Nebraskans do. I think that it's time to look at who we're sending to prison. Do we really need to send all these folks to Tecumseh? Uh, or are there alternative means? In my talking with Joe Nigro, I, I hope I said your name right, Joe. Right. <laughs> yeah, a very insightful individual who knows way more about this than I do. But he talked about the alternatives and the cost to taxpayers and how keeping people in their homes on probation, we can monitor them closely. And the cost is way decreased to the state. They can stay employed, they can be paying taxes, they can be paying at least part of the cost of their, uh, their involvement with the justice system as opposed to sending someone off to incarceration in a penitentiary. And all the costs that go with that and all the downside to go to that. So I think we, we need to look very strongly at alternatives, but then there are other parts of this problem that need to be addressed. And, and obviously if someone's violent or a threat, I don't want him in my neighborhood, you don't want him. Those people who've committed crimes like that, they need to go away and figure out at what they're doing with their lives and hopefully come back with better answers. But the truth is most of them are not violent and most of them at one point in a time or another are coming back into our society. So let's spend the money, and I know that's a dirty word in government to say spend money, but let's spend the money now to make sure that we're dealing with mental health issues. Uh, Senator Boltz has done a really good job of drawing attention to this issue that we ignore people with mental health problems until they commit a crime and then the police have to deal with them, and that's not exactly why we're hiring the police is to deal with mental, people with mental health problems. So let's Let's address those issues. Let's hold people accountable for drug use, and give, but give them the opportunity to get out of that destructive habit. Let's make sure they have educational or vocational training so that they can go back and become responsible citizens. And that goes back to the childhood, uh, early childhood education uh, tie-in. Start early and uh, keep them um, educated and productive and the more tax-paying citizens we have and the fewer That's people we have sitting in prison, it's better for better all for of all. us. It's the humane thing to do, but I also think it's a very practical, real-world type of solution. 
I agree. That kind of leads into, we just have about four minutes left. Um, death penalty is going to be on the ballot uh, this uh, fall. Uh, this kind of ties into our conversation about prison reform. Uh, do you have a, an opinion? Have you formed an opinion about uh, that yet? Yes. Would you like <laughs> to share it? <laughs> I, I, I think death penalty it will be a great evaluation of where we're at as a state. I watched the debates last year. I uh, actually went down as a guest of Senator Haar and sat on the floor the day they voted to override. I've never experienced anything like that in my life. Um, <clears throat> I think it's an emotional issue, but if we step back away from that emotion and look at the practical effects of having the death penalty, the costs involved, and what it's really producing, I think that it, we would all come to an agreement that it really hasn't achieved any goals that serve our society well. I know people will disagree with that, and I'd feel glad to discuss it with them, but I watched the debate very carefully. Okay, great. Um, just in the last few minutes that we have, uh, how can voters contact you and learn more about your campaign? Do you have a website? or? I do, and I appreciate you asking. And I, I would be glad to have anyone contact me who's interested in the campaign. Uh, my website is www.rickvestforlegislature.com. I'm going to take a risk and put my email out there, rickvest, R-I-C-K, V-E-S-T, the number five, at gmail.com. And okay. I, I would just encourage all the voters, big year going on here uh, with the death penalty issue, with a lot of big races, presidential, down to local. Uh, it's a good year to be involved. There are a lot of good people working hard already. I've mentioned a few of them, but there's always room for more. So we would welcome your involvement. Thank you very much, Rick. It was an informative, uh, fast uh, half an hour. I appreciate it. You got me through it. <laughs> I didn't bolt and run, so right. I feel like it. <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> uh, thank you uh, again, and hope you come back and uh, visit us again. Appreciate Pre it. Appreciate it, Jane. Okay, thank you very thank much. You, Thank you for joining us for this edition of The Watchful Citizen presented by the Lancaster County Democratic Party. I'm your host, Jane Egan. Until the next time. <laughs>